Good afternoon and good evening. Uh, my name is Maureen Thibault. I am Communication and Project Manager at ECOMOS International, based in Paris. On behalf of ECOMOS, I would like to welcome you to this online workshop as a side event of the EU Regions Week on the theme of the Green Transition. Our webinar today is titled ECOMOS European Quality Principles, Ensuring Quality for Heritage Through Sustainable Solutions. I will let my colleagues tell you more about this topic, and I would like to hand over to Grania Shafri, ECOMOS board member and a member of ECOMOS Ireland, who will be moderating this session. Thank you, Maureen, and welcome to everyone uh, to this European Week of Regions side event on the theme of ECOMOS European Quality Principles, ensuring quality for heritage through sustainable solutions. We have four expert speakers today who will give short 10 minute presentations, and we will devote the remainder of this session to a question and answer discussion, which I encourage all of you to participate in. At its General Assembly in 2020, ICOMOS formally resolved to commit its triennial scientific work plan to address the climate and ecological emergency, to make this a focus and priority for all our committees, international scientific committees and national committees. Cultural heritage offers immense potential to support transformative action and just transitions by communities towards low carbon climate resilient futures. Cultural heritage is particularly central to Green Deal strategies focused on Ur Europe's urban and rural landscapes, such as the Renovation Wave, the new European Bauhaus, as well as all the other actions and programs arising from the EU cohesion policy and those mobilizing public and private investments. The EU has committed one third of the 1.8 trillion euro budget of the next generation EU money to the European Green Deal. This is not insignificant. Cultural heritage is a driver for sustainability and climate action, and ECOMOS is strongly convinced that heritage protection and climate protection are not contradictions, but complement each other. The sustainable use and reuse of the built heritage can help reduce our ecological footprint and the environmental costs of demolition and construction. Cultural heritage can also assist in guiding the transformative changes through understanding how humans relate to places and things and the know-how of humans in responding to past social and environmental challenges. It demands circular economy approaches that promote the reuse and conservation of resources. It demands knowledge, information, creativity, and cultural capital. And it requires social cohesion, shared love of place, inclusive approaches, all of which are prerequisites to the common action, common climate action. And this is the reason why a discussion is needed on the use of the European quality principles in the various European Union funds, so that where they have the potential to impact on built heritage and cultural landscapes, Damage, um, damage and adverse impacts are avoided, and most importantly, genuinely sustainable and quality solutions are achieved. So if you can have the next slide, please, uh, uh, Nina. So the European quality principles, just very briefly, we'll go into it in more detail uh, shortly. EU funding represents a considerable investment in the future. This is substantial public funding, and it is important to ensure the effective and sustainable use of this public funding, to ensure that the awarding of future funding will not impact negatively on cultural heritage, to ensure the establishment of standards to underpin an effective code of practice and which support all stakeholders, and to ensure the outcomes bring positive impacts and positive perception of the EU role to all EU citizens and their communities. Next slide. So the quality principles document stems from the work of an expert group assembled uh, by ICOMOS under the mandate of the European Commission and the framework in the framework of a flagship EU initiative of the European Year of Cultural Heritage 2018. 
The main objective of the document is to provide guidance on quality principles for all stakeholders directly or indirectly engaged in EU funded interventions that could impact on cultural heritage. So these would cover European institutions, managing authorities, international organizations, civil society, local communities, private sector, and experts. And the quality principles acknowledges there's a need to develop capacities for all stakeholders. Now my next slide. So just uh, very briefly, uh, the quality principles, uh, we have the second edition uh, published in 2020. It's available on the ICOMOS Open Archive website. The link is there and we put it in the chat box. It's multilingual, so we now have it uh, not only in English and French, but 10 other European uh, uh, languages. It's not just a series of tools, it's more robust than that. It provides an overall template to ensure quality. It provides practical and accessible advice. It's aimed at ensuring good outcomes, and I particularly draw your attention to the selection criteria Andina will talk about. And it supports all stakeholders and it reinforces a commitment to sustainability. And we just advise that we use the full document. There's an abridged version, but please do uh, familiarize yourself with the full document. So I'm going to um, uh, introduce our speakers now, our first speaker. But before I do, I'm going to ask you to use the question or the chat uh, facility here. Just if you've um, questions or comments that you want to, to raise, We'll watch those during the presentations and then we'll, we'll put them or we'll digest them or we'll talk about them uh, in the in the Q&A after. So our first speaker this morning, we can maybe Peter can load up his slide as I'm introducing him. I'm uh, is our first Peter, speaker is Peter Cox. Peter is former and first president of the ICOMOS International Scientific Committee on Energy and Sustainability. He's a member of the ICOMOS Climate Change and Heritage Working Group, who produced the seminal 2019 Future of Our Past report and was a founding member of the ICOMOS Sustainable Development Goals Working Group. Peter is going to give us a very brief overview of ICOMOS's work on climate change and cultural heritage. And uh, you, know, you might come out of that, uh, your yep. presentation, and let yeah, me load up. Thank you. I was, wasn't allowed to. Uh... <laughs> to start up. Um, Thanks, Peter. I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, but hi, everybody. My name is um, Peter Cox, and ooh, I've been involved with ECOMOS for a very long time. And I like to think that ECOMOS Ireland has kind of led the charge on this. Um, we hosted the ECOMOS ADCOM meeting in 2010 in Dublin Castle in Dublin. Ireland and we part of this was was really coming from the participants and they were concerned that the drive towards energy efficiency might have a, a real impact on um, our built uh, heritage. So ICOMOS Ireland, ICOMOS France and ICOMOS Belgium uh, set up a working group to look at this and we presented at the Paris meeting in 2012 and it was decided then that this was a concern and therefore um, we should propose an international scientific committee on energy sustainability and climate change and this was ratified in Beijing in 2013 and uh, I got fingered as chair of our president of that committee and I'm very pleased that I've handed it over to one of my fellow speakers this morning, Francisca Ass. Um, but in 2010, uh, ECOMOS Ireland, uh, myself and a, and a colleague, Cathy Daly, um, actually did one of the first studies of the impact of climate change on heritage. And this was uh, co-funded by the de then Department of Environment, Heritage and Local Government and the Heritage Council of Ireland. And it really did kind of raise uh, interest. And um, I'm glad to say here, here we are, what, um, 12, 13 years later, uh, we've got all this European funding coming to us. 
The main activities, though, of ECOMOS uh, ISIS, and this was our original logo, um, and it was a major activities uh, ha has been related to energy efficiency in retrofitting our traditional and heritage buildings. And there are now many studies available. And um, if, if, if any, any of the participants want uh, kind of links, I can send them uh, later maybe to Maureen and, and she can circulate them. Um, we got involved also the Fraunhofer Institute of Building Physics in Germany um, is running what's called a, a live laboratory where we got given a 1720s um, cooperage building in a, in a massive um, kind of monastery. And um, with uh, Fraunhofer leading it, but ECOMOS, they've looked to us to, to support them and to, and I, I go over there uh, maybe three times a year to, to participate in the learning uh, that is coming out of that. And what we've done is converted about uh, eight or nine rooms in, uh, into kind of high performing, low carbon um, kind of uh, examples and testing and we're monitoring it every, uh, 15 minutes every, every every day. So we're gathering an awful lot of very good information. I also represented ICOMOS uh, on the international, or the, sorry, the Central European um, Committee to write uh, the EN 16883-2017, which is a guidelines uh, for the uh, energy retrofit of our traditional and heritage buildings. And this is now signed mostly into individual countries and kind of standards as well. Um, we've uh, got recognition and we've been asked to speak at various conferences, including a very important IPCC one in Canada in 2019. Um, and my colleague, Adam Markham, who, who, who is head of the Union of Concerned Scientists, um, kind of phrased, I, I think, a very good, good phrase. And no community, culture, region, or type of heritage is immune from climate risks. Climate change impacts from sea level rise and coastal flooding to drought and to extreme heat uh, will sorely test the adaptive capacity of diverse cultural systems. But as Gronje has said, um, we can learn from uh, the way our forefathers designed buildings to exclude heat, to include natural uh, ventilation, etc. The ICOMOS work group on um, SDGs, um, again, um, I, I'm sorry to, to fly the flag of Ireland, but the gentleman that actually um, chaired the group to write the SDGs between 2013 and 16 um, was the UN, or sorry, the uh, EU ambassador to the UN, David O'Sullivan, who, who was uh, an Irish um, kind of uh, civil servant and very, very um, good and, and, and brought this together. ICOMOS got involved very early in this and uh, through Andrew Potts of, of the US and he kind of uh, really pushed and pushed to get cultural heritage recognized. And obviously uh, 11.4 is the very important one, um, but others like, um, you know, uh, seven is, is, uh, is climate, or sorry, is energy efficiency, 13 is, is climate change. So um, these impact, and again, um, there wasn't much uptake early on, but we, we uh, a group of us attended the launch in Quito in, in, in uh, 2016. And out of that, we, we grew this SDG work group, headed originally by Andrew, then uh, a very good uh, tenure by, by Ege Yildirim from, from Turkey. And now it's headed up by, by Gabriel. Um, and he's brought a whole new energy uh, to it as well. Originally, initially, we, we had a Bureau of Nine and a wider membership of 40. I'm pleased that that is very much more uh, grown uh, today. And I now see all these TV uh, personalities, but politicians appearing on TV with our, our SDG badge, which is fantastic to see. Um, and uh, out of the Quito meeting, we had our first joint meeting with IUCN and UCLG. 
and that has continued uh, to, to grow. And in fact, a, a meeting was held, hosted by ECLG um, in, in South Korea um, so in 2018, I think. Um, the group have been really working hard and they've produced a lot of documents, which I, I don't have time to go into, but this is one particular. Uh, that is a more recent document and very worthwhile uh, having a read through. The, um, also out of um, the, uh, that group and led again by Andrew Potts was um, really the um, Climate Change Heritage Work Group which is another kind of work group within ICOMOS. Now it was extended its tenure a couple of years ago, so it's still pretty active and headed up now by Will McGarry. Um, but in, initially there were 28 ICOMOS members representing 19 countries. This is the group that came together in Paris to finalize uh, the very important document that has got great um, kind of legs uh, since its release which is the future of our past. And it was released in July, 2019. And it's really heightening um, you know, our objectives of the Paris Agreement, but heightening ambition to address climate change, uh, to, to mitigate gate greenhouse gases, enhancing adaptive capacity and planning for loss and damage. And I think sadly, this is something we do have to really look at because we in Ireland are already losing uh, very valuable heritage uh, assets from uh, coastal erosion in the west coast of Ireland and, and now flooding, etc. So it, it really is an important document. Uh, and then our commitments to the Paris Agreement, of course, is, uh, you know, uh, really well, well, well documented. And uh, the work group have just recently produced Strength and Culture Heritage Resilience for Climate Change. And again, um, you know, from the ICOMOS website, many of these documents can be downloaded and, uh, and understood. And then out of that work group um, really was created the Climate Heritage Network, which is now a worldwide uh, successful organization, NGO. It's hosted by ICOMOS in Paris and um, <coughs> it's, uh, <coughs> it's led again by Andrew Potts. He's, his name seems to come up everywhere. But this is a very, very, and now I, I think from the last time I talked to Andrew, there's over 200 members uh, worldwide, and it's a very active group. We launched it in Edinburgh in 2019, and um, thankfully just before COVID. So we were all able to personally meet and enjoy that. But we've been working recently on a document which uh, is due for publication uh, either now or within the next few weeks. And it's called Buildings Global Status Report 2022. Uh, and as I say, that's going to be a very, very strong document as well. So I'm Peter Cox. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Peter. And that gives uh, an introduction to a sliver, a, a small section of, of what ICOMOF has been doing in, in, in the area. I suppose maybe just to say that the strengthening cultural heritage resilience for climate uh, change is something ICOMOS has, has contributed to. And it's important because it makes direct, a direct link that document, which is a European Commission OMC document, but it makes a direct link uh, to the uh, quality principles. Uh, and on that uh, reference to the quality principles, which is what we are here really to, to learn about, uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Andina Taut. And Andina's background is uh, art history, cultural management, and cultural heritage restoration. She's now with the European, or the Romanian National Institute of Heritage as expert for European cultural policies. Andina worked for 13 years in Brussels, and amongst other cultural briefs, uh, she was policy advisor to the uh, European Parliament's Rapporteur for the year, European Year of Cultural Heritage. So she has been involved from the outset in the evolution of the European quality principles and uh, is now a member of ICOMOS's uh, task team, international, uh, working on advocacy and implementation. And she's also ICOMOS Romania's focal point for the quality principles. 
Um, so I'm going to hand over on Dina if you can take us through some key points on the quality principles. Thank you. Thank you. And good morning, everybody from Bucharest, home of ICOMOS Romania. So why do we talk about this issue in the first place? Well, the need for quality principles in the case of cultural heritage projects or impacting cultural heritage became obvious after the 2007-2013 funding period. These two images present the case of a restoration that does not respect the medieval features of the heritage site. I think you all agree that something had to be done. Between 2007-2013, the biggest funding program was the European Regional Development Fund, managed by DG Regio as part of the EU cohesion policy. During the seven years, allocations to cultural projects were over 6 billion euros. In the next MFF, 2014-2020, the amounts were even bigger, but we don't yet have the final numbers. But as of 2014, the EU started to revise its approach to cultural heritage. In 2015, there was already a European Parliament's resolution that requested a compulsory quality control system to be applied throughout a project's life cycle to all new structural funds for cultural heritage. Based on this strong political mandate, the program of the European Year of Cultural Heritage 2018 included a dedicated flagship initiative, probably some of you remember this, called Cherishing Heritage. As part of this initiative, the European Commission, with the precious help of ICOMOS, set up an experts working group on the issue of quality in heritage interventions. The group's mandate was to provide guidance on quality principles. The experts working group produced a report called European Quality Principles for EU-funded interventions with potential impact upon cultural heritage initially published in 2019 and revised in 2020. The revised edition can be found on the ICOMOS Open Archive in several linguistic versions. The main objective is to provide guidance on quality principles for all stakeholders, European institutions, managing authorities, international organizations, civil society and local communities, private sector and experts. And since we are meeting today in the framework of the European Week of Regions, allow me to stress the importance of this document for the regional authorities at various levels of governance. Because after all, it is you who are very much involved and concerned by the implementation of EU funds. In order to help you select the best projects for funding, the document also contains a checklist with all the aspects that you should look into. Keep in mind that this document focuses on the central theme of quality. In this respect, it recalls the key concepts, the international charters, the European and international conventions and standards. At the same time, it takes into account the changes in recent years in the understanding and practice regarding the conservation and restoration of heritage. The recognition of cultural heritage as a common good and responsibility is a precondition to reach quality. And as you can see, the quality measures proposed have to be implemented at the different stages of the project. For the purpose of today's meeting, let's focus on the issues that are directly linked to your work and to the topic of this webinar but I really recommend you to take the time and read the entire document. Preservation of cultural heritage should be understood as a long-term investment for society. Therefore, the research phase prior to the investment is crucial for the proper development of the restoration project. We can consider the cultural value protected when it is placed at the same level as the financial value of the investment in the process of assessing the costs and benefits. Authenticity is a key feature, and those of us who work in cultural heritage know what a difficult concept this is, 
and how much the heritage sites change over time. Nevertheless, the quest for authenticity should be placed at the center of the restoration project while respecting the evolution of the site and its distinctive elements. When new elements or new uses are required, the project should make sure that there is harmony and balance between the new and the old elements. Also, the new uses of the heritage site should be in line with the needs of the local community or with the heritage communities as defined by the Faro Convention. Regarding the tendering procedure, a double envelope system should be implemented, allowing the technical and financial offers to be distinguished with priority given to the technical one. Following the same line of thought, we argue that for any intervention, and here we can also include the types of interventions aiming at energy retrofitting, compatible materials and proven techniques should be used that are suppo supported by scientific data and practical experience. Moreover, provisions should be made for any additional needs, such as research or testing of materials. Of course, education and training play a key role in the process, as well as the skills needed to properly carry out good quality interventions. One last point needs to be made about the auditing of EU funds. Because in 2020, the need for a better use of these funds in respect to cultural heritage was acknowledged by the European Court of Auditors. In light of their report, the quality principles recommendations can help all stakeholders reach a higher quality of the project. Because, of course, we should avoid situations like the one you see in the picture. Even if the invoices are in order, and even if the monument now has a brand new emergency evacuation system, we are still looking at a medieval fresco that was destroyed in the meantime. With, it, with its constant dedication to the protection of cultural heritage, ICOMOS is here to support you in this process. Follow us on social media, contact us for liaison with your national focal point, or simply reach out to us so that we can search together the best way forward. Thank you. Thank you. And you might show on Dina's last slide there because it has some um, some 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 links, I think, on, on it. Um, if yes, yes, yes. We we'll post some of those again and anyway as we as we go along. Thank you very much, Andina. And I just at this point I want to remind people, you know, to use the the, the question and use the chat box for any comments or, or thoughts or, or if there's any particular issues, there was a lot there and there's a lot in the quality principles that you might want to, to uh, come back on in the, in the question and answer. So I'm now going to introduce the current uh, president of ICOMOS, um, ISCIS, as, as, as Peter described it, the Sign International Scientific Committee on Energy and Sustainability, Francisca Hask. Francisca is an architect and specialist in sustainability energy retrofit as, as this applies to cultural heritage and particularly the built heritage. She's senior researcher at URAC Research Group on Energy Retrofit of Historic Buildings. Francisca is a member of the ICOMOS Climate Change Working Group and a member of ICOMOS Germany. And she's going to zoom in a bit now on the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive and ensuring quality for heritage can be achieved. So thank you, uh, Francesca. Uh, Francesca, you might unmute yourself there. We still can't hear you. So I was Perfect. looking for the thank button you. to unmute. <clears throat> So now you can see my presentation. As you said, um, yeah, I'm now the president of this uh, International Scientific Committee on Energy and Sustainability. And um, I'm happy that I don't have to uh, take this responsibility alone, but with a, a board um, together, where also uh, James uh, Ritson is a member of, and um, he will speak later on that. And with in all these activities, Peter already uh, introduced in the beginning, we are now uh, mainly working as a kind of technical expert group. Um, 
dealing with the um, uh, renovation of buildings. And one of the main topics, of course, is the um, new energy performance directive that is proposed by the EU. And therefore, I want to step in first with a few on the whole building stock, not only the protected one and the historic valued one, but uh, looking at the whole building stock and the impact it has on our um, environment. There are these numbers that we might all know, but this is, they are really worrying, let's say. So we, uh, the building sector is re responsible for like 50% of material resources used in the EU and 38% uh, of the use of primary energy, but also to 16% of water use and to 33% of waste production. And in the end, that means to 31% of the CO2 emissions that we have. So it was in 2017, situation didn't change a lot since that. So there is really a big need to improve this building stock because especially the CO2 emission, it has really high impact on the, uh, the climate change and of course following to that this uh, uh, more um, occurring natural disasters that bring our heritage to risk. So it is really in the interest also of cultural heritage to uh, reduce this environmental impact of the um, whole building stock uh, in general. Um, Therefore, it is really also welcome, also from our side, that the European Commission took the renovation wave in the building sector as one of the lighthouse projects within the next uh, generation EU um, package. And um, it was also very welcome when uh, Ursula von der Leyen called that not only an environmental and economic project, but also uh, that there is a need to make it as a new cultural project for Europe. Um, in December last year, there um, was then published the first proposal. So within this renovation with the um, recast of the um, energy performance uh, directive of EU was one of the of the parts they wanted to introduce. And last December, there was a first proposal uh, for the amendment of the existing uh, EPBD was uh, published. Um, and looking how the historic building stock is mentioned there, um, there are two points where they speak about these uh, historic buildings. One is in Article 5 related to the setting of minimum energy performance requirements, where they um, where stated that member states may decide to adapt the requirements referred to in paragraph 1 to buildings officially protected as part of a designated environment or because of their special architectural or historical merit, insofar as compliance with certain minimum energy performance requirements would unacceptably alter their character or appearance. And in a second um, point, it is mentioned where they deal with the minimum energy performance standards that the building should have um, before it gets renovated. And um, also here, they say that uh, member states may decide not to apply the minimum energy performance standards uh, to these buildings uh, protected or with historical merit. Um, seeing that the situation was a bit um, unclear and we started to discuss also within our uh, ECOMOS um, scientific committee, but also with other members of ECOMOS, 
how to deal with that and how we see this uh, inclusion of the historic building stock in uh, in this new EPBD. And it was, um, let's say, there are this, uh, two sides that you have to consider on the one side. And I show you on the, you see on the left side pictures that Andina once sent to me. Um, you have really this, uh, this danger that, again, this new EPBD will really be um, a driver to, to destroy uh, the cultural heritage, the buildings that we have, uh, because they want to uh, reach this energy performance standards without looking on uh, the heritage value at all. On the other side, we see that we have a big share of uh, uh, historic building stock with architectural merit. Um, just as an example, I show here the, um, the um, age classes of uh, historic buildings within Europe, the share of history or all the buildings. And you see that there are a lot of um, the building stock is built before 1945, for instance, uh, only to say that there, there are a lot of buildings and they make an impact. So we have to do something with them to reduce the energy demand. So, and to find there a good way to bring in the, the, the needs for historic buildings in the new EPBD, that was the discussion around. Mm. And we know that there are good examples. We know that there are examples where you can uh, improve the energy performance, reduce the CO2, um, um, CO2 emission of buildings, but still, accept and, and uh, protect the heritage value. Uh, just as one example, I show you a database that were, I was involved to, um, to establish with uh, best practice examples on energy retrofit of historic buildings with a, a variety of, uh, of different buildings. So we have there up to now like 60 examples and it's still growing. Um, so in our uh, discussion, we had um, or we uh, we replied to the EU Commission to say what for us as ECOMOS would be important to bring in this new EPBD. We set some uh, discussion points, um, and we started that there should be the possibility still to make exemptions for uh, a certain number of protected buildings, monuments. Um, where uh, not uh, this uh, energy performance standard can to be applied. But we also have to see the, the big group of uh, buildings that might not be listed, but still have an architectural um, uh, merit. And then um, we said that here, it would be good to define what is an exactly uh, change or alter the character or appearance. What does it mean in the EPBD? And there we see, of course, there's a need to bring in the quality principles. This is the document that uh, provides your knowledge about that. And it's the, the only document in the moment that gives you here guidance and should be really recognized uh, for the EPBD. Um, we also mentioned in our uh, discussion paper that there's another one that already um, was also mentioned by, by Peter Cox. Um, there's this standard EN 16883 that also can give you um, somehow a guidance to the quality of a project. And I think it's really important to, to um, uh, point out that the standard is also the quality principles. They don't set any kind of um, number of what is quality. You, you cannot define it like that, like uh, energy performance in the building, but you can uh, uh, define the processes, how you come to a, a good solution in the end. And both the quality principles and the standard, they provide processes that ensure the quality of the project in the end. And I think this is really an important point that you bring the experts in the project, that you go several steps, that you evaluate the solutions again, and uh, you trust, as Andina said before, the solutions you apply. And this, I think, is a really important point. And uh, we have to, 
try to bring it in this uh, new EPPD. Um, and so on the, in that way, we can also cover the non-protected buildings that are maybe not specially mentioned in the end uh, in the APBD to uh, have this over um, all standards. So I uh, just wanted to refer again to these uh, um, quality principles. And what I think is really, really important always to, to look at the process uh, and it's also in the quality principles really stated that the process is really part of a possible success. And I think it's one of the most important part to have the right process. As a last slide, uh, what is not really, <laughs> let's say a good message for us is uh, now there uh, is um, a draft report from the rapporteur, uh, Saren Coffey, I, I think that. I pronounce the name completely wrong, the same. Um, and uh, for the European Parliament, and they um, try to make amendments to the uh, draft that already came out. And now they uh, want to change it that um, member state may decide to adapt the requirements. So uh, the first article I mentioned before um, to these uh, buildings with uh, historical merit, once those buildings have reached at least EPC class D and only insofar as compliance with further minimum energy performance requirements would unacceptably alter their character or appearance. So I think there is in the moment, is really again the point to discuss really hardly that uh, a class D is already set again a standard and we cannot cover all the historic buildings with, with that. We have to ensure um, to make as much as possible, but still having the cultural values in mind. So um, that was my presentation. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca. Kieran Koff. <laughs> Kieran Koff. Yeah. So it's. Yes, no, no. Again, so. I'm a, I hate to say it, another Irish man. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway so. but, but just to say, Francesca, you, you, you touched on something really, really important there on, on, on the value of the process. And I think what this is, is, is really important. We can come back to it in the Q&A. And I really do encourage people to, you know, if they aren't writing now, to be thinking about their comments. Um, the quality principles are there for potential impact on cultural heritage. It's, it is our historic buildings. It's our heritage buildings. And that may include our modern buildings and landscapes. So uh, the process also applies and could be very applicable even though the technical solutions might be quite different. So I think it's just something to, to bear in mind. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our final uh, speaker, uh, uh, James Ritson. And uh, James is based in the University College of Estate Management. He's a member of ICOMOS uh, uh, ISC on Energy and Sustainability and a member of ICOMOS UK. He's going to talk about the importance and benefit of maintenance as a sustainability strategy for pre-1919 housing. He's a very important message to give us all this morning, particularly if we want to keep our global temperature rise by 2030 within the 1, 1.5 uh, degrees of the Paris Agreement commitment, because we now need to think about minimizing the carbon that we're consuming during this period. So James, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about what happens when we apply these quality standards and actually some of the benefits that we see um, to our, uh, shall we say, our environmental performance of our buildings. Um, the first thing I'd like to uh, start off with is what is building conservation? You know, building conservation is about managing change within the historic environment. It's not just about the preservation of what exists. And going along with that is probably the most important part of building conservation, which is was coned over 100 years ago by the founder of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. And though it does sound like an advert for tooth, toothpaste, it actually is save off decay with daily care. And it shows the importance of actually looking after our built environment um, and, and how much that is 
part of building conservation. But to put it into some context, I'm going to talk about the biggest uh, body. Uh, Francesca just showed you the slide with the uh, number of historic buildings in each of the states. And I'm glad to see that the UK was still listed there. Um, uh, but one of the things that I would like to talk about is at the context of where my research came from. The biggest body of historic buildings that we had in the UK that didn't have a clear guidance to was the historic housing stock. We have an ambition in the UK uh, to be net zero by 2050, and we need to use or understand how the existing built environment um, and the importance of the existing built environment is in reaching those targets. The advice for historic pre-1919 house uh, owners is at best ambiguous and at worst ineffective and damaging. So we've got to think about how are we going to deal with this huge body of historic buildings. There were 4.7 million of these houses in the UK and just so in the in England alone, and that equates to 425 uh, interventions or uh, refurbishments every single day from now until 2050. So we had to come up with a policy or a strategy to how to deal with those uh, from an environmental. And that's really important of why conservation quality and uh, when we're dealing with cultural heritage and the quality principles are so important. So the strategy outline is it had to be flexible and restrictive. Every building is different. We needed, we did, we needed a policy that didn't restrict further enhancement through many of the uh, pieces of research being done at the Van Hauser Institute and many other institutions around Europe and so forth. It had to be cost efficient and affordable. Okay, we need to be applying this to buildings and it needed to be scalable. Okay, we were dealing with 500, uh, nearly 400, sorry, over 400 refurbishments every single day. Um, and it needed to be applicable across there. So those were the, the things that were set out when we started to look at those. Um, and one of the things that we had to remember when we were dealing with this is sustainability is more than just reducing carbon emissions and energy reduction. There is the triple bottom line of cultural, environmental and economic factors that needed to be in balance. OK, we needed to understand the cultural value of our buildings and how to do that. So the research took an approach There's what happens if we simply looked after our buildings? We applied those quality principles, those conservation guidelines to buildings. Would there be or what would the energy savings be when we did that? And I'm pleased to say they were extremely significant. The, what we came to coin as benign changes. So these were heritage based uh, uh, interventions into the property that didn't impact upon the heritage of the building, but improved the environmental performance and really much followed the principles that were laid out in the quality uh, uh, um, guidance and the ICOMOS guidances, which was as much as necessary and as little as possible. And this also followed some of the guidance that we started to see in the heritage literature. One of the most energy efficient ways to preserve the environment uh, was continued and regular maintenance to safeguard our historic fabric that came from Historic England, our NGO uh, in, in the UK. So we defined that what would be the best way to forward uh, uh, this and we defined the benign changes. And these are changes to buildings that neither have ha either have little or no effect on the heritage of the dwelling or damage the building fabric, either to the fabric itself or the way that the building needs to perform or react. So these were interventions that were small scale, uh, maybe wide across the building, that could be, into, uh, could be applied without having an impact on the heritage. And then the point of the research was, what was then the energy and carbon emission savings? We need to first off divide what we meant by heritage and protecting. So, you know, the impact on heritage can be roughly divided. There's the visual heritage, the impact on the visual, the, the visual. There's the impact on the fabric and the actual building itself. And there's also the impact on its use. And that's something that's important because, as I said, it's about managing change. Our buildings change, our environments change and our working change. So we need to be able to be adaptable to that one as well. So on the right, just because of time, sorry, on the left on the slide, sorry, uh, just because of time, there is some um, uh, examples of what we were applying. So making door, making sure doors and windows fitted correctly, draft proofing doors and windows, reinstating historic shutters and heavy curtains, uh, make uh, constant temperature uh, schemes, uh, 
uh, blocking up old redundant um, uh, flues and vents, replacing boilers, insulating hot water uh, cylinders and, and pipeworks and so forth, and other basic maintenance tasks. And we applied all of these findings uh, and then we came out and we found something very surprising. So what was, what was the strategy? Well, it, the benign process was actually what it did is was a series of events that allow you to adapt through the, the process. By applying conservation principles, you actually found a, a large energy saving what was uh, uh, achieved in buildings. This is uh, on the right is a very simple example of how a typical Victorian terraced house in the UK may be adapted from now until 2050. The, a badly efficient boiler was replaced with a more high efficiency boiler, hot water tank insulated, imp improvement of heating controls, hot water tank replaced with a multiple coil unit, so it allows for the intervention of renewables in the future, secondary heating input, and then a, a low carbon technology at the end all having a low impact on the heritage, but having significant value. And this is why actually having quality principles are so important, because by applying these conservation principles, we are still achieving large energy savings. And the also advantage of doing this, rather than large scale interventions at all, at all cases, was it allows for adaption for the varying changes and our requirements and the costs are spread. And this is really brings on to the other, some of the principles that it doesn't have to apply to big projects. It can be small, uh, interventions as part of a wider scheme, maybe part of a refurbishment of an area, one that maybe you don't think of necessarily as cultural heritage or as energy savings. But but by applying the quality principles, we can have a much better impact upon both of those areas. And this became a really key point. When we started to, to find, um, um, graph these uh, costs to benefit on a chart, what we found was that all of the heritage interventions were low cost and high impact. And what I mean by high impact, it reduced the carbon emissions and energy usage of the building. And actually what we found was all of the heritage interventions were really were in the, that uh, shaded box in the center, in the, in the, on the left hand side of the chart. It was in that beige box and they were having big impact for low cost. And what we were then beginning to find is that they got to a point where actually there was a reducing cost to benefit now, uh, cost to benefit of putting in large scales damaging heritage uh, interventions and actually having minimal improvements to some of the uh, heritage inf uh, enforcement, but having huge economic costs and uh, um, uh, uh, heritage damage as well. So it was about trying to actually showing that by applying conservation standards, you are actually becoming incredibly energy efficient. Just to give some cost examples, and I've put some euros in there for reference because I realize uh, the, they're there. But we started looking at for a typical house in the UK, what would be some of these interventions? So when we started to look at some of the range between seven and two thousand pounds per dwelling, we were seeing as part of the interventions we were seeing that we were getting about 40% energy savings between uh, between 20 to uh, 60% with an average of about 40% energy savings. But to get to the 80 and 100%, we were seeing the costs double, uh, quadruple, and even at times more than 10 times the amount. And actually, when we start multiplying that out, you can see it goes from being a £32 billion pound project uh, for the UK to £300 billion. And that, that's... Um, quite a, a sizable figure. And the time frame of doing those inter interventions was an issue. So actually by using and applying conservation, we can still have a really positive, uh, uh, conservation principles, we can still have a real positive impact on carbon emissions. And I will repeat this, all of these interventions does not stop you going further and applying further technologies. Some of the new developments that Peter, Francesca have talked about, still applying those conservation principles and still improving the environmental performance. By, any, by no means does this, po this policy of looking after our buildings as a sustainable measure restrict the development of those technologies. In fact, if anything, it helps uh, uh, instigate those. So that's a very broad overview. And I want to kind of reinstate that I've come up to my 10 minutes, that this was a really broad overview, but actually by applying conservation principles to projects, we are not only helping to look after the project, but we are meeting 
um, those real big challenges we're facing uh, of energy efficiency as well as conserving uh, our historic buildings. Thank you very much. Sorry, th thank you very much, James. Uh, it's a really uh, important point to, to, to end on. And just to say that the quality principle specifically, I think recommendation 11 and uh, 18 um, acknowledge the importance of maintenance, but also the, uh, the encourages uh, funding of small scale uh, incremental projects. And I suppose the other point is, is that in for some of the more, uh, you would say, extensive or expansive uh, 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 renovation projects, if you don't tackle the fundamental maintenance issues first, you're actually building in inherent problems. So you yeah. kind of ha ha have to do it. Anyway, we will move now to our uh, question and answer session. And uh, I'll just in, invite everyone. There's just some links there on the slide, but we might come out of this the the slide and and uh, bring back the panelists, um, uh, if if we can, uh, Maureen and Yuna, and then uh, see whether our 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 audience, our attendees, have 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 any questions or comments. I see there is a there is one comment in 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 the chat, uh, which I will come back to. But maybe maybe while we're waiting for a for for questions um i i might invite uh um on dina well actually i see peter cox has his has his hand up so peter if you want to yeah. come in and then i might uh, 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 ask on dina sorry to respond a bit. sorry but yeah. um that was actually a, a, an accidental hand raiser oh <laughs> but, <laughs> well they're known uh, as well yeah but now that i'm here um yeah it's um I suppose, it, again, just to hit back on, um, Gronje, what you, you mentioned and Francesca alluded to is that it's not just um, our heritage uh, buildings, uh, but, but also our traditional buildings that we call, which, which basically, to be honest with you, could, could be pre, from pre-1960, um, because it was after the Second World War that, that kind of things started changing and, and they, you know, they started introducing new, new kind of systems of building. But <clears throat> um, I was also involved through the ICOMOS ISC on 20th century, uh, uh, writing the Cadiz document, which again is a very good document and I'm sure it's on the ICOMOS website. Um, and it, it's basically an, an overview of how to conserve early 20th century concrete buildings. And these are as important uh, as our very, very historic buildings. And to be honest, um, you know, they probably do contribute an awful lot more, uh, you know, CO2 emissions, because when we do some of our studies, um, you know, we, we're actually continually finding and working with Historic Environment Scotland, Historic England, etc. Um, we find that um, older buildings with solid wall masonry, if they're well maintained, actually perform an awful lot better than people think. And therefore, um, you're starting off at a lower point. And again, James hit on this as well. Um, that you need to know your building, you need to know the construction of your building, the condition of your building, and uh, it really is a, a process rather than um, sticking a finger in the air and saying, oh, well, let's stick some external insulation on this building and save it. So, sorry, I, I won't go on anymore. <laughs> no, the po point, is, point is, 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 is well made, Peter, but I just want to... Just bring back. We'll 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 get stuck in because I, I I'll go to the comment. But I wanted to ask on Dina, um, because in case we don't get the opportunity to just explain what ICOMOS, the task team, and the focal points have been doing, um, to to the participants, um, because since the second edition of the Quality Principles was published, ICOMOS has been moving on and doing things. So maybe on Dina, you're the focal point for Romania. You're also on the task team. If if you wouldn't mind very briefly, maybe just saying what what kind of uh, activities you've, you've been engaged in. Thanks. Yes, of course. So first of all, I'm going to put 
my head as a national focal point for Romania. I want to stress the fact that I'm not working alone on this. I'm working together with the president of our national committee and with other colleagues. And to give you some examples of the kind of activities that we carry out, uh, to start, it was looking into the translation of the document in Romanian. The translation is almost ready. It will be published soon. Again, we, we started to taking part in the workshops with the other national focal points that ICOMOS has set up in every European country. And this was a very emotional experience. You know, Grania, we were in the same room, so but I want to share this with everybody because we tend to see this, um, this problem from a very narrow perspective, from our own experience. But it was only when we all got together in a room in Paris at the ICOMOS headquarters, and we started sharing our problems at national level with the implementation of different funds and with different kind of heritage projects that we realized how big the issue really was. And we started sharing different uh, kinds of problems because, of course, in every state, the situation is managed differently. But we realized that there are some common issues that should be addressed maybe as a group. Uh, also, uh, in the same uh, capacity, I attended together with the other national focal points, the exchange of views that we had with the European Commission, with DG Regio especially, but also with DG EAC. And, uh, I think this also needs to be mentioned, the fact that the European Commission have been very supportive in this uh, in this process over the last year and a half that we started to, to work in a more structured way because we have um, exchanges of views on a regular basis and uh, we get to, to make suggestions. And of course, they assure us every time that to the best of their possibilities, and by this I also mean the legal possibilities of the European treaties, they, um, they made a pledge to help us uh, pass on this message. And uh, as part of what this mes message should be, well, if we want to talk in very clear terms, then at this point in time, when we are at the launch of the new multi-annual financial framework, so 2021-2027, you know that all the member states have signed the partnership agreement with the European Commission, and now every country is trying to define the specific operational programs. And this is done via a, what is called a monitoring committee. So the request that was passed on to the European Commission from all of us was that these monitoring committees in the member state take into account the quality principles when they draft the different programs that are funding or impacting cultural heritage. And even ICOMOS has sent out the list of all these national focal points so that all the monitoring committees in all the member states can access directly the ICOMOS advisors. Uh, last but not least, we are engaging in different dissemination activities. Only last week, we had a very, very very important, but also great dissemination opportunity in Timisoara. Timisoara is going to be next year European capital of culture. And with this opportunity, there was a lot of common reflection about how we should do things in, in a great way, also for cultural heritage. And we got the opportunity to present the document and to exchange with a lot of architects and professionals active in cultural heritage. And the uh, the, the reaction was uh, extraordinary. After the presentation, people started to come to us, started to share with us the stories that they face on a daily basis on the ground. They all acknowledge the problem. They all hope that they will, there will be a way to make things better. And the picture that I showed you with the big exit sign in the middle of the fresco was actually handed over to me by a participant at this meeting. Initially, I had another picture for the slide, but that one was just too good not, not to be missed. So this is about the national focal point and ICOMOS has put together, some of us are part of this uh, task team, it is called, and this uh, um, a smaller group of experts stemming from the wider group of national contact points. And we are uh, organizing this uh, exchange of views with the European Commission. We are trying to follow up the new programs because at the, it was pointed already, the document stemmed from a previous MFF. Now, of course, we need to bring this into the, the today's reality. So we try to follow up the different programs that are happening now, that are starting now, and that are of interest for our work. Very good. Th thank you for that, Andina. And I'll just say we have 34 uh, national focal points, and we also have focal points from the International Scientific Committees as well. And they are available 
you know, I suppose at, at a member state level uh, for, for to assist any any of the um, um, any authorities or uh, developing programs. So that's an important message. I might. I'm just wondering, um, uh, uh, Maureen and, and you know, if it's possible because we we have a comment from and forgive me now. I'm probably pronouncing your name incorrectly. Hedia Arfa from TU Delft. Um, and maybe if you wanted to just speak a little bit about it, uh, can, can, we bring, can we bring them in? I mean, the question is, I would like to mention, it's not a question, it's rather a comment to mention about our recent publication at TU Delft regarding developing a model for adaptive reuse process of heritage buildings. Maybe it can be interesting for developing systematic process models. Is it possible to share the link? Well, you're more than welcome to share the link. Um, and if you if you wanted to ex expand on it, uh, you can. Um, Andina mentioned the workshops. There's also been a workshop in Macedonia, and uh, there's one upcoming in Lithuania, Estonia, and uh, and and Ireland have have had them. One while well, we're waiting to see whether uh, Edia wants to expand or not. Um, one question I have maybe for, for the, the panel, really in terms of areas of, of research, and I know we've, we've touched on some, but with a specific focus on, ah, here we are, Hedy, I'll, I'll bring you in now. Um, I think the, if you on mute, you should be able to, to speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, Thank amazing. Uh, hi everyone, I'm uh, Hedy Arfa, a PhD researcher at at uh, TU Delft at the section of heritage and architecture. And actually, uh, regarding the point mentioned by uh, Francisco, I also wanted to highlight the importance of the process. Uh, because also in my thesis, I, I'm trying to develop a methodology for developing uh, and uh, for effective. Uh, adaptive reuse of heritage in buildings. Um, so yeah, I can imagine that considering energy efficiency and all the mentioned points are needed in, in the process, but more than that, an effective process is quite needed. Uh, so this is the point that I, I wanted to uh, yeah, bring up, up here. and. Yeah, I, I'm sorry that I have a cold, <laughs> so <laughs> my voice is not really, yeah, in, in shape. But this is the, the point that I wanted to highlight. Okay. I don't know, Francesca, if you want to come back on any of that, if you were able to to catch that from Hadia um, or not, because she specifically referred to your presentation. Yeah, I can just uh, support what she said, and and um, yeah, as I I said that it's um, what we all know because of the um, diversity of our uh, historic building stock and also of the traditional architecture. It's it's not possible at all to uh, to define a kind of um, let's say score or uh, something of quality it's uh, in cultural heritage that's not possible so we have to ensure that for we find a way mm -hmm. uh, that we uh, consider this uh, this diversity and uh, on the same side it it applies to uh, to all and this, I think, is really only possible if we define the, the processes very well, uh, whom to include, what to include, to consider, and so on. And, and I think that um, is very well done with the quality principles. And also, um, if I, I just open your work and, and also there, I think it has to, yeah, really, you have to, you have to think about again and again, um, how to to implement the project and and so I uh, really welcome also this work uh, you have done in, in Delft. Mm -hmm. thank, okay, thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you, Hadia. Just to say we've we've kind of opened up the floor now. So if people feel more comfortable 
using their raised hand mechanism if they if they want to ask a relevant question or a comment um, uh, they can they can use that mechanism as well um, I might just ask James um, obviously the research you did specifically relates to domestic buildings and dwellings can you see or has it or you know are you looking at its wider application to other types of other types of buildings uh, yeah thanks for the question uh, yeah well it applies generally across the cultural environment and again it applies um you know we've known what was interesting about the research is we've known for a while that historic buildings perform better than we, we were told and we knew that um well maintained buildings perform better than we would be told they were by the modeling um and then so i think yes we've we've begun to start doing a lot of work i mean obviously there is a mass of buildings certain certain mass of buildings in each area one of the areas that we've been looking at is actually um, uh, 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 things like historic churches and other cultural properties that they apply. But the principle of looking after a building first and then applying and thinking about how you then go maybe the more, uh, shall we say, I don't want to use the word traditional, but more typical sustainable interventions uh, apply. Um, it, it's across all of the cultural built environment um, that you can apply this principle that you need to look after the building first and then think about that. And that's where those quality principles come in. If you approach sustainable refurbishment of what can I throw at a building, uh, particularly with a historic building first, that's where you're going to get the damage. If you start from a conservation point of view, uh, regardless of the type of building, and then see what you can do within the restrictions of that conservation. Uh, and not see those as restrictions. I think Peter was really clear on that, that actually, if you understand the building first, actually, there's a lot you can do with the building. There's a lot being done. We, uh, Francesca and I have recently organized a symposium uh, about overheating in buildings. And it was found there that some of these historic buildings for hundreds of years have been able to cope with quite extremes in climate by traditional methods. And so actually understanding the building is fundamental. And I think that's one of the core principles of this, uh, of the, these quality of actually beginning to understand uh, and actually have a quality process rather than starting from a viewpoint, I need to put solar panels on. You may very well put solar panels on, but that shouldn't be your starting point. The starting point should be looking after the buildings first. And that applies to all buildings. I hope that answers your question. No, absolutely. And I suppose I'm very mindful that we're having this discussion at a time when, you know, across Europe, um, cost of living is increasing. And I suppose we're really mm. trying to do as much as we can with this little also yeah. financial outlay as well as carbon outlay. So um, it, it kind of is, is it, it's always wisdom across a, a, a wider response. And this is where I suppose that point, the cultural heritage has this kind of tacit wisdom uh, to, to give to us as we tackle these big existential crises. Maybe a, 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 a question to all of the panelists, um, and then I'm going to put a question to our attendees and try and, but um, in terms of, we've mentioned research, but are there areas of um, particular research gaps with, which could connect or bring in the quality principles more? I mean, but all of you have presented in, in, in where the quality principles apply in terms of the kind of specific green tr transition, but if there were particular areas that that struck you, uh, if you wanted to comment on that, um, it would be helpful. Peter has his hand up, and you might all have 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 contributions. I'll just ask you to be to be to be brief. Anyway, we've about ten more minutes left. Thank you. Yeah, I I, I seriously think um, upskilling our trades, uh, training and education is one huge gap um, right across Europe from because I, I'm lucky that I work in many different countries and it's the same everywhere. You know, over the period of modern construction, we've lost an awful lot of our traditional skills and um, and training and apprenticeships and things like that. So I think that's an area that <clears throat> ICOMOS and particularly, um, you know, applying for some of this European money uh, should go towards. Well, that's very good. I, I might bring on Dean and then that again, because I know you could maybe talk about the charter um, uh, project. 
And yes, you, you read my mind. Yes, and actually, when you asked the question, I was thinking of the exact thing that Peter said. Education, training, skills, these are definitely issues that we, we all face. Uh, indeed, the chapter project is an opportunity that probably the whole sector should be aware and try to seize this opportunity. It's a different kind of project. It's called a blueprint. Well, it's a special category of projects, and um, it needs to identify the needs, the gaps in education and training across Europe in the field of cultural heritage, and afterwards propose a series of solutions, things like emerging curricula, things like forecasting the skills of the future, of course, taking into regard um, the green transition, the digital skills and everything, and the needs to draft policy recommendations for the EU decision makers and also the other levels of governance. So maybe I will put the link in the chat. It's a um, it's a reflection that is happening at the moment. The project will run until 2024. ICOMOS is part of this uh, of this project, is uh, one of the um, most important members. So uh, we can uh, maybe find the time to think a little bit about how all these issues that we all face and that we all agree on could be integrated in a blueprint project that is supposed to propose solutions to, to be investigated at EU level. Thank you, Andina. I don't know. I, I have I have a question, but before I um, bring Pedro in, maybe to ask it, Francisca and and James, do, is there anything that strikes you? Um, do you want to add anything? I would uh, prefer to give the the word to the um, to the floor. Perfect. Uh, to Thank the you. floor. Yeah. <laughs> to the floor. And um, Pedro Murillo. Now I'm going to let you introduce yourself, please. And maybe actually, if you might say, if there's a, you know, if you're representing any particular organization or your background, just so we, 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 we know where you are, but you have an interesting question. And uh, please, uh, I think if you are mute, you can, you can speak to us all. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, are you uh, listening to me? Yes. Yes, perfect, Pedro. Yeah, uh, okay. So uh, I was just uh, asking you for um, a brief question because uh, I, I know that you talk about a lot of stakeholders and, uh, but I, I think also that the stakeholders also are subjected to power. So uh, I, I would like to ask you if you, uh, how the EU quality principles are addressing this, uh, because from my experience, when I see that picture from the Ecomos Romania with the fresco and the electrical appliance, I see that I saw it a lot of uh, times. Uh, in uh, my experience is in Brazil, and I'm not, uh, now uh, doing a postdoc in uh, the Faculty of Architecture at Porto. Uh, and I see a lot of uh, this as a result of disagreement of uh, stakeholders or even uh, disagreement uh, based on uh, which one has the, the most power to do the, the decision making. So I'd like to ask you how uh, you, uh, maybe for Ecomos Romania or also for Francesca, how uh, this uh, is a uh, result, this is being resolved in this uh, in your experience, or even in the EU quality principles. I don't know, Francesca, do you want to come in on that first and then on Dina? Okay, uh, let's so I start very uh, briefly. And um, I will answer maybe this one more regarding um, energy retrofit measures in historic buildings, since that is my uh, focus topic, let's say. And um, what I see here is um, that it's really important to have um, professionals that uh, are uh, forced to be involved in the process and they have uh, a certain voice. So, and these professionals, for instance, in Germany, we have special uh, energy consultants um, with um, an education also in uh, heritage um, protection. So, and, uh, you have to involve them in a decision-making process about a, a refurbishment. Um, if you deal with uh, buildings of uh, uh, specific um, cultural um, value. So, uh, and I think 
this is uh, this tackles a lot of things. So on the one side you have to have the training for professionals, and on the other side you have to make the sure that these professionals are really involved in the decision making with with a uh, with a certain power. I completely agree, and I think this is also uh, written in the in the quality principles. And I give for that uh, over to Andina that uh, who can I think comment on that much better. Well, I understood very well the question. Of course, there is no clear cut answer to, to a very difficult question like this. What I can give is two elements of uh, reply. First of all, we do say in the, in the quality principles that they are addressed to all stakeholders. Now, uh, this was the first step, but what we should probably all do now is to make sure that the stakeholders know about these uh, quality principles. And we saw it last week, we had a big dissemination uh, activity. And the general reaction was, uh, wow, everybody should be talking about this. And yet it's the first time we hear about this issue. So I would say as a first point, if the stakeholders know about these principles, know about this possibility, know about this uh, qualitative work that has been done by ICOMOSC at EU level, they are empowered to request for these principles to be applied. And then second point, we need to bring in the topic of the financial correction. And this has been uh, a point uh, that was addressed from the beginning, because of course, everything is nice, but what happens when these principles are not respected? And when they are not respected, what it was requested at first was that a financial correction is applied. Yet, this is not uh, very simple to do, but this is something that we, we try to to investigate how exactly could be applied. I have mentioned the Court of Auditors report. Uh, the auditing of EU projects, it's a very complicated process. There are different kinds of indicators, some of them which are defined by the European Commission together with stakeholders, together with other institutions. So I think there, there is a lot of fine tuning to be done at this level. And even if we don't manage to end up with a clear indicator that implies financial correction, if it is not respected. I think we can still do a lot more, a lot more work towards defining what could be quality indicators, even though we cannot end up with a one size fits all, because as exactly Francesca was mentioning before, we cannot have a, a miracle solution that applies to all heritage in all Europe. It doesn't work like this. But the, the issue needs to be addressed and the financial correction should be an option for uh, cases that are obviously going in the wrong direction. Thank, thanks, Sandina. Um, Pedro, did that uh, uh, help, your, help your question? Yes, okay. It is a difficult question. Yes, yes, yeah. thank you. Um, I suppose the, the, in the seven selection criteria, there is one called discernment. And in a way that is about ensuring that the appropriate skills and expertise are engaged. And that's not just, you know, at, you know when you're involved, I'm an architect too, in the kind of design and implementation phase, but it actually is necessary in, in the development of the program itself. And this is again, I mean, it speaks to this process, the whole way in, 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 in which a, a team is put together and a, and a project brief is, 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 is conceived. Um, I'm just conscious we're coming up to 11 and, uh, and I think we probably might draw the, 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 the event to a, a, a close. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending this morning. Um, it's really just a kind of a small introduction to the quality principles and their application and use in this enormous task that we have uh, as we as we transition to a to a lower and and maybe non-carbon future that we are doing it in a way that's responsible and it's responsible to our cultural heritage which is something that gives meaning to our lives and therefore it really does matter to uh, our well-being our economy our social cohesion uh, as well as on very ta ta te technical e e e elements as well. Um, we have, um, this is the second uh, event we've had in Week of the Regions uh, this week on the quality principles. 
We've had one on their um, potential application uh, in the whole reconstruction challenges uh, on Ukraine. And these are both being recorded and they will be available uh, on the ECOMOS website uh, shortly. Uh, so we just would encourage you to familiarize yourselves with the quality principles. As I say, they're available. We're working really, really hard at, at the European level and at the national level and across scientific committees to, uh, 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 to make sure that they are applied and used. They're incredibly useful. The EU and the E-Commission, uh, European Commission, recognize that. They want them to be used because ultimately this is about ensuring that uh, all of the money that we contribute to doing all of this work is, 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 well, is well spent. So thank you once again. Thank you to Maureen and, and Yuma for uh, looking after and, or, and, and uh, making the uh, morning go smoothly. And thank you to all our participants. And most importantly, thank you to everyone for uh, attending. And hopefully we will keep in touch somehow. So uh, we let you leave now. Thank you.